God has blessed us in many, many ways with many precious things. And sometimes we have a tendency just to take these things for granted. One of the things that God has given us are our souls, isn't it? The Bible says that God formeth the spirit of man which is in him. Each one of us, whether we actually think about it or not, has a very precious, immortal soul that dwells deep within. And folks, it is the most valuable thing that you and I possess. But God has also given us our bodies, hasn't He? I find it interesting that hundreds and hundreds of years ago, David, as he contemplated his body, said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David did not need all of the scientists to dig deeply down into the depths of his being in order to see how remarkable he truly is. All he had to do is look upon himself and all that he could do with his physical body and he knew, I have been blessed with a gift. And he was thankful for that. Another thing that God has given most of us is a fairly good measure of health. Now, I realize that as we get older, our health begins to fail, and we have various difficulties that we have to struggle with. But folks, for the most part, all of us through the course of our normal lives have been blessed immensely with wonderful health by the Almighty God. And that health is a blessing, isn't it? But another gift that God has given us is the gift of life. Folks, life is very simply defined as animated existence. Another individual defined life as follows, that period of time between conception and death. Folks, life is what you and I are living right now at this very moment. And it doesn't matter whether we are a little child or whether we are in our 80s or 90s. We are presently enjoying the gift of life. And yet, some individuals neglect it and maybe even treat it badly, don't they? We find that there are some individuals who just don't take care of the life that they've been given. In fact, they so mistreat themselves that they fall under poor health very early in life and maybe many of them never reach their full potential and die very early because they haven't taken care of the life that God's given them. There are other individuals who just refuse to protect life. You see, they don't understand the value of the life. And thus, they don't protect it. And then there are other individuals in our society who viciously, viciously take the lives of other individuals and have no regard for life whatsoever. This morning we've entitled our lesson, Learning About Life. This is the first within a series of lessons. And this morning we're going to be talking about three different points with regard to life itself. First, let's consider God and life. God and life. Folks, inherent within God is life itself. What we're saying is that life is a part of the very nature of God. Jesus, when He talked about the Heavenly Father in John 5, 26, says this, For as the Father, listen to Him, hath life in Himself. Folks, God didn't have to be born. God didn't have to be created. God didn't have to be made. Life didn't have to be instilled within Him. He has always existed. Why? Because He is life. It is a thought that is almost beyond the comprehension of man. A way of saying it is this, God is life. Now what's important about this particular concept to us is that as we think about God and life, 
It means that the theory of creation triumphs over the theory of evolution. There are two predominant thoughts as to how you and I came into existence. One of them is the creation theory, the other is the theory of evolution. Folks, you and I, as creationists, we begin with who? We begin with God, don't we? And if we begin with God, then we begin with life. Evolution, on the other hand, begins with something totally different. Where do they begin? Folks, they begin with gases. They begin with matter. They begin with something that is just as lifeless as it can possibly be. It can't think. It can't reason. It can't speak. It can't see. It can't do anything on its own. We say life comes from life, don't we? And the evolutionists will have us to believe that life comes from absolutely dead matter. Folks, you and I are more rational than the evolutionist. And we don't have to have as much faith as the evolutionist has to have. Did you know that? Because we begin with God who is life, don't we? We think about God and life, folks. God is the source of all life, isn't He? We go back again into the Scripture, and in Acts chapter 17, verse 25, Paul is standing there atop of Mars Hill. He's looking at those Epicureans, he's looking at those Stoics, and he's speaking to those Greek philosophers, and he says this, It is God, that unknown God to you, that gives us life and breath and all things. It is in Him that we live and move and have our very being. You see, because God is the source of life, isn't He? From the very beginning, God has created life on this planet. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, the Bible says this, And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. Watch this. Every living creature that hath life. Folks, when God created this world, everything He put in the waters had life within it. Why? Because God instilled it therein. We jump down just four verses, and we have God speaking again. And God said, let the earth, Bring forth, listen again, every living creature after its kind. When God created this planet, there was absolutely nothing dead on it, folks. Everything that He put here, whether it be in the water, whether it be on the earth, everything was living. Why? Because God is life and the source of life. We turn to Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a what? Living soul. Folks, God is the giver of life. Let's talk secondly about the beginning of life. And I'm not talking about the creation. We've already talked about that. I'm talking about the beginning of human life. As we've already stated, God miraculously created both Adam and Eve, did He not? We've already read Genesis 2 verse 7, wherein God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. But in order for man to be here and in order for man to exist, there had to be a female ultimately produced, did there not? And God did exactly that. He caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He took one of his ribs, and the Bible says this, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. A simple rib. God cloaked it in flesh, instilled within it life, and brought this beautiful creation unto man as a living being. So life came through miraculous means, did it not? 
God miraculously created Adam. He miraculously created Eve. But then I find it interesting that He told these two individuals to go out and to repopulate the earth, didn't He? And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Within humans is now the power to do what? Create life. We call that procreation, don't we? There's something that we need to understand about that. Folks, pre procreation at that point in time became a part of the natural laws of the Almighty God. Now I realize that Adam and Eve were created miraculously. But there has never been another human being who has been created miraculously since that point. Every one of them have been procreated, have they not? Through the union of a man and a woman, except one. That's Jesus. Through the, one, through the union of a woman and the power of the Almighty God, Mary brought forth a son. But a very unique birth, wasn't it? A very different birth, a miraculous birth. But we as human beings are here because of natural law. There's so many individuals who don't understand miracles and they'll talk about the miracle of childbirth. No, it's the natural law of childbirth, folks. A law put in place by the Almighty God. But when does that human life begin? Big question in our society, isn't it? Huge question in our society today. First point that I would make is this. Did you know that we as human beings are composed of living cells? Billions and billions and billions of cells. And every one of them is alive. Every one of them. Just think about that. If you could, you could just separate out each one of those little cells. And every one of those little cells would be just alive as it can possibly be. I am just a conglomerate of what? Of living cells. Well, that sounds pretty, doesn't it? But it's the truth. Folks, when a man and woman come together in a relationship... All that happens is this. A man fertilizes the egg of a woman, and guess what happens? Immediately, there is a living cell. Not a dead cell, a living cell. That's important to remember. Because you see, if that cell is living, then it is what? It is life. Now my next question is this, what kind of cell is that? That is a human cell. If it isn't, what is it? You tell me. Because I know this, given enough time, guess what's going to happen? Eventually a baby is going to be born. And eventually there is going to be a full grown adult that comes from that one little cell that is what? That is just as alive as it can be. One individual made the statement, he says, that little cell is not perfect yet. Not in the sense of being a full-grown human, but in nine months, he's going to be a baby or she's going to be a baby that a mother is holding in her arms. But guess what? Even then, that little one is not perfect. Is she? She still has to be fed. She still has to be cared for. She still has to be cleaned. She still has to have all this attention given to her. And that's true at 4 and 8 and 12 and 13 and 17. I find it interesting that so many parents look at their 15 or 16 year old kids and say, well, just hit the door. 
If you feel that way, if you want to act that way, you just hit the door. And that 15 year old's got this face. You want to know why they have that face? Because they know I can't leave this house and provide for myself. Because mom and daddy are still doing what? Mom and daddy are still taking care of me. But they reach 18, 20, maybe not 40. But folks, they finally reach a point in life, don't they? Where out the door they go, and guess what they do? They take care of themselves by themselves. And it's at that point that we say what? We say they are full grown. They are mature. They are able to do whatever needs to be done for self at that point. Folks, anywhere in that process, however, they're still what? Imperfect, aren't they? Just because that one little cell is not yet perfect does not mean that it is not alive and it does not mean that it is not a human being. Life begins at the very moment of conception. No doubt about that. But I find it interesting that we still have a lot of people in our society who would raise their hand and scream out, A preacher! Life doesn't begin at conception. Yeah, it does. But they still want to deny it, don't they? Here's what I find interesting. Did you know that the heart beats in that little baby that was just conceived at 22 days? Folks, that is before a woman even knows she's pregnant. Did you know that? Three weeks. And there's a little heart inside that little bitty being that's pumping. And what does a heart do? Hearts pump blood. Now that's important because in Leviticus 17, 11, guess what the Bible says? For the life of the flesh is in the blood. If there is blood coursing through that little bitty creature in that mom, guess what? That is life. Now, I don't mean to disturb you by this next picture, but I want you to see something very important. That is the picture of a 12-week-old baby. I don't know about you, but I see a human being, don't you? Head, eyes, nose, mouth, hands, body, feet. You convince me that is not a person. Convince me of that. You'll never do that. And yet there's a lot of individuals in our society today who will say, that right there is not even a human being yet. Are you kidding me? How can you see that and not say, that's a human? You see, because still people deny it, don't they? Folks, you and I honor the Word of the living God, don't we? That is our standard. That is our source of proof. I find it interesting when we turn to Luke 2 verse 12. Angels appear to those shepherds in the field, don't they? And those angels tell them to go find the Messiah. And they say this, And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You see the little word babe? comes from the Greek word brephos. Now at that point, guess what? Jesus is already born, isn't He? He's already outside the womb. We turn back just one chapter. Luke 1, And the Bible says this, And it came to pass, when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb. Wow! Folks, the Greek word is identical. It's brephos. But this time, the little baby isn't outside the womb. The little baby is inside the womb. And the Bible says that the babe, the brephos, the same one used of Jesus outside the womb, leaped in the womb of Elizabeth. Folks, as far as God is concerned, it doesn't matter whether that child is in the mother's womb or whether that child is outside the mother's womb. It is brephos. It is a babe. And we've got to hold on to that 
in our world, don't we? We turn one other verse, Jeremiah 1 verse 5. God is speaking to the prophet Jeremiah, and he says this, Before thou wast formed in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee to be a prophet among the nations. You see, one of the ideas in our society today is this, that that little baby in the mother's womb is not really its own individual. It is just a part of mama. It is just a lump of flesh that mama can do with as she chooses. Oh no. Folks, the Bible says that before Jeremiah was even put in her belly, he was known to God. And when he was there, guess what God did? God sanctified him and ordained him to be a prophet. Did God see a unique, one-of-a-kind, only individual in Jeremiah, mother's womb? Yes. Folks, it is a human being, life, that is in the precious womb of the mother. You see, life begins at conception and is perfected over the next 18 or 20 years. Let's talk briefly about some of the essentials of life. We've already talked about two of them. One of them is God. Folks, if God didn't exist, guess what? There would be no life. Even if there were masses of gas or whatever out there in the universe. If God didn't exist, there would be no life because non-life cannot produce life. Only God can. But notice secondly, and we've talked about this, in order for life to come into existence, there has to be a man and a woman. And if you will look at the screen, I've got out beside there, man-husband. Woman, wife. There's a reason for that. Because the other is not authorized by God. Just because you're a man who can make a baby and a woman who can make a baby don't mean it's right. I will therefore that the women marry and bear children, Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5. There's an order. There's a place wherein children are supposed to be conceived. It's not just a man and a woman. It is a husband and a wife that are to bring children into this world. They're absolutely essential, aren't they? Never seen a husband make a baby without a wife. Never seen a wife make a baby without a husband. Takes two, doesn't it? So we've talked about those, but let's talk about these next ones in a little bit more detail. Folks, in order for there to be life, there has to be a very caring, kind, giving, sacrificial mother in the process. Do you know that? That's a part of motherhood, isn't it? And sadly today, in many, many places, we find that women get pregnant and women bear children. And guess what? They don't manifest the care that needs to be there in order to have a child. You see, there are some women who are so selfish that the moment they find out that they are pregnant, the only thing that they can think of is themselves. I can't do this. I don't want this child. And unfortunately, we have developed a process in the United States of America and throughout the world to abort that child. Folks, all that means is kill it. That's all it means. You see, that's not a caring, loving mother who will enter into a clinic and do away with the life of her baby. But you see, there's also women... They're on drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, living ungodly, unhealthy, unwholesome lifestyles. And guess what it causes, folks? The death of children. 
Sometimes that death happens in the womb. Sometimes it happens out of the womb. Let me read you two examples. The night before Lindaya died, McKinney later told the police she took three different medications. The opioid, Percocet, the anti-anxiety medication, Xanax, and Subutex. Lindaya's grandmother noticed that McKinney's knees were buckling under her when she stood. McKinney recalled that she later fed the infant, but didn't know what she did with Lindaya after that. The next morning, Lindaya's grandmother tried to wake McKinney, who lay at the foot of the bed. Twice the grandmother asked where the baby was. Then she saw a corner of Lindaya's blanket beneath McKinney. Oh my, the grandmother told the still high McKinney. You're on the baby! According to the death report, the state of Kentucky ruled that McKinney's neglect had caused her baby's death. Folks, that's not uncommon. Did you know that? In Utah, a 17-year-old girl named Jaslyn Raquel Mansfield died last year of acute methadone toxicity. Her mother, Courtney Nicole Howe, was on prescription methadone during and after her pregnancy. How told authorities that she twice used a syringe to mix the narcotic with children's Tylenol. Her reasoning, Jaslyn wouldn't eat her sleep and she wasn't her normal baby anymore. According to a 42-page police report marked confidential, Courtney admitted that she did, know what, did not know what to do to get Jaslyn help, the report said. Folks, this is going on all over our nation, all over our world. You see, in order for little babies to have a chance in our world, there has to be a caring, nurturing mother, at least, who provides for that baby. But there's other things that are needed. Breath, isn't it? You and I can only live about three to five minutes without breath. If you don't believe that, go home and just choke yourself this afternoon. <laughs> Won't take you long to let go. Isn't that true? And so oftentimes we have been in hospitals and we have watched an individual pass away from us, haven't we? And all of a sudden that person will take a breath and we'll start counting one two, three. And maybe it's 15 or 20 or 30 seconds and finally they either breathe out or get and breathe again. And we count again, don't we? Until finally that last breath is taken. And what do we say? They have breathed their last. Why? Because breath, oxygen, folks, is a basic to life. But we also find that blood is an essential quality of life as well, isn't it? Each one of us has coursing through our bodies 1.2 to 1.5 gallons of blood. Tim may have two, I don't know. He's a big guy. But did you know if you lose one third of your blood, then guess what? Death is going to occur one-third of your blood. You see, the Bible says that the life of the flesh is where? In the blood. If you don't have any blood in your body, you're not going to get the nutrients and the oxygen and the minerals that your body so desperately needs. And you will die. Another essential for life is nourishment, isn't it? Most individuals can go about four to six weeks with no food. They can go somewhere around eight to ten days with no water. 
And part of that nourishment also involves a good night's sleep as well. And as of this date, they don't know exactly how long a human being can go without sleep before he dies. But it's not long. About five days and you become disoriented and you become a totally different person. Some people say it doesn't take that long. It just takes a day without my nap. Isn't that right? But folks, those are absolutely essentials to life. Nourishment of the body, taking care of the body, a good diet, food and drink and good sleep. If not, we will die, won't we? And lastly, our body must have the spirit that God has placed within it. For as the body without the spirit is what? Dead, the Bible says. Jesus was hanging there upon the cross of Calvary. And the Bible says in Mark 15, 39, And when He had cried out with a loud voice, He gave up the ghost, the Spirit, left the body of Jesus, and He died there on the cross of Calvary, didn't He? You see, there are essential elements to life that must be there. And if you take away any of those things, guess what? Life cannot exist and continue to exist. What have we learned this morning? Go, we've learned that we've only scratched the surface of really talking about what we need to learn about life. Did you know that? Now folks, the points that we made, I believe, are essential and need to be learned by all humanity. One of the points that we've learned is this. God is life and He is the giver of life. Just that one fact alone would radically alter the world, wouldn't it? I guarantee it would radically alter the United States of America. Also, life begins at conception. The very moment that egg is fertilized, a living cell is developed and life begins. We've also seen that there are essential elements of life that must be present for life to continue. In our next lesson, we're going to talk about something pretty interesting. Taking life and the giving of life. And both of them involve death, doesn't it? The giving of life. We talk about suicide. That's the what? The taking of life, isn't it? We'll talk about that. But then we can also talk about an individual being willing to what? Give his life for another person. And folks, that's different than suicide. So you'll have to set aside two weeks from today because that's when that lesson will get taught. Because I'll be out of town next week. Life. Folks, life is precious, isn't it? It's a gift. That's what we talked about at the very start of our lesson. It's a gift given by God to us. So the question that we ask is this. How are you living your life? We can live it in one of two ways. We can live it to the honor and glory of God. Or we can live it frivolously, fecklessly, and selfishly for our own selves, can't we? Today, do you need to render your life to the Almighty? You can by obeying the gospel. The steps are simple. Hear the Word of God. Believe in the Christ as the Son of God. I find it interesting. Jesus said that what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Repent of sins, confess the name of Jesus, and be immersed into Christ, and arise. And guess who you put on? Christ, who is our life, the Bible says. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. I fear maybe you're an erring child of God. Your life used to be well spent in the service of God, and now you spend it more for self than for God. There's a song that we sing, isn't it? All of self and... None of thee. Folks, it needs to be just the opposite. None of self and all of thee.
Do you need to repent of sin and ask God to forgive you? Once you confess that sin, we'll pray with him for you as together we stand and sing.